this is Ellen in Philadelphia. It's Saturday morning and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Driscoll in Dallas. Today we are talking with acclaimed post-disciplinary artist Kirsten Hovland on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers and Sister. <laughs> you see, Ellen, I finally got it right. Great. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone to episode 237, and today we welcome our special guest artist, Kirsten Hovland, to Light Talk. Welcome to Light Talk, Kirsten. Hi, thanks for having me. And what part of the world are you in today? I am in Los Angeles, where I am based, so I'm home. <laughs> You're right down the street from me. <laughs> yeah, just, you know. Well, it's great to have you here with us. So before we get started, Ellen, could you please tell our listeners a little bit about Kirsten's fabulous career? Absolutely. Kirsten Larissa Hovland is a post-disciplinary artist specializing in pixels, programming, and light for music and performance. She received an MFA in experimental animation and integrated media from California Institute of the Arts and a BFA in visual communication with a minor in computer science from Iowa State University. She is a co-founder and principal artist at Electronic Countermeasures, a Los Angeles-based firm specializing in immersive experiences and environments of all shapes, sizes, and mediums. So, I have the first question. What exactly do you mean by post-disciplinary, and how did you get there? It's kind of a long, a long journey. Uh, what I mean by post-disciplinary is uh, the work we end up doing doesn't tend to fit within traditional disciplines or traditional mediums. So what what I end up being interested in and doing is, um, you know, it's very much between like theater and lighting, dance, uh, video, time-based medium. It becomes kind of hard to explain with a single you know, a single kind of catchy phrase, like, what do I do? I can't say I'm a lighting designer. That's not exactly true. I can't say I'm a projection designer, even though that's a, the nomenclature around what we do, and especially where kind of I fit in this industry, uh, will often tend to put me in a place where I don't necessarily fit. So trying to find a name for uh, the kind of art we do, uh, my studio and for my practice specifically, is, is difficult. So post-disciplinary sort of covers everything. We don't want to describe, you know, pigeonhole us into a particular uh, discipline or division of labor or, or, or in that same way, claim an expertise in a very specific, you know, a lighting designer carries a certain aura and, you know, specific amount of training, amount of, you know, uh, role within a production that isn't necessarily, like sometimes we will fill that role, but I don't want to say that's what I do compared to some people who are lighting designers. No, I was going to say it makes sense. I mean, you know, you sort of want to be uh, immersive in a lot of yeah. ways yourself, you know? Exactly. In a lot of ways, it means knowing uh, knowing enough about a lot of things, knowing who, who the questions to ask to kind of fit these disciplines into a larger, more immersive, more, uh, you know, more collaborative type of, of discipline that this industry is kind of moving towards. Um, those roles are becoming a little more messy and have been, I think, maybe since video entered the entered the stage. Yeah, for a while, convergence was sort of a buzzword. Like, you know, is the light from the video, is the video from the light? Who controls the color? Who controls the intensity? So it sort of started getting that way. I think that you should start your own uh, graduate program in post-disciplinary uh, <laughs> artistry or... I may not even be the first. <laughs> I think it's it's a you may not, but it probably be, you probably do it very well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because it's all like light. Well, you're lighting designer, you're a set designer, you're a costume designer, you're a projection designer. No, I'm I'm like everything. Uh, John Conklin would call you a theater animal. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Except I don't always do theater. <laughs> I don't always do theater. <laughs> so a little well, complicated. And, and John Conklin doesn't do theater. He does opera. So, yeah. uh, but you know, that's the thing. I mean, uh, I, I think it's great that, that, that we're branching out now that now we're thinking much more holistically about the art instead of like a bunch of specialists, you know, mm -hmm. I must tell you, I saw your website. I'm kind of jumping a question here, but I saw your website and I was so impressed with, you know, the type of work you do. And, uh, and of course we've all seen your work on, uh, on television and, you know, the, the, obviously the, uh, 
the uh, uh, now get the, tell me if this is right, uh, Ellen. The Video Music Awards, right? VMAs. Right. Okay, I right. keep on calling right. it the Music Video Awards. Right. I think that it's grammatically more correct. But I may be wrong. Who knows? Mm. But anyway, we've all seen your work on that. And we've all seen your work also on the NBA, uh, which we're going to talk about, too. The NBA <laughs> bubble we'll be talking about, which sounds like a lot of fun. So, yeah, it looks like you do just a little bit of everything. Yep, that's uh, that's where I get the post disciplinary from. Like I said, a little bit of everything. Um, I guess to answer Ellen's uh, kind of other question, like how did I get here? Uh, I started you know, doing, of course, theater in high school. You know, I was I had a terrible case of stage fright, which you know I seem to be getting over just a little bit <laughs> enough to do podcasts anyway and to talk at LDI. But uh, you know, much much more comfortable back there making the lights do things. You had an old ETC, you know, Express, one of those you know, dimmer, dimmer system, all those, you know, it was pretty, pretty good for a Midwestern high school. And that was a lot of fun, but every, everyone's like, oh, you should, you should go into engineering. You know, your dad's an engineer, get a, get a real job, go get a real education, all that sort of stuff. So I didn't even consider, uh, you know, that a career in the arts would be for me, you know? Um, so I went into computer engineering and I, but I was at Iowa state, I put myself through school as a local crew stagehand. Like that's how I paid for my, back when you could, put yourself through school on a part-time job doing, you know, pushing boxes in and out of trucks. Uh, for, for, so it was sort of a, I never quite left the world of performance. Like I, I really enjoyed that as a part-time job, you know, did my, did my schooling by day. Um, and as I was getting deeper into like what I was doing in the engineering front, I found myself uh, very, pretty much getting sucked into the, the world of the defense contractor. Um, and it was becoming very hard to get out of. So at a certain point, um, I realized that if I, if I really wanted to do something not dealing with the, uh, the military industrial complex, because even, even I was finding that the work I was doing um, uh, at, uh, I, was, I was also working at the virtual reality application center there. So I was into early VR and human computer action. I was, but a lot of that work I was doing was, was very much funneling towards like, as I found out later, the drone program. Uh, so I kind of made a clean break. I, I'm like, that's it. I can't do this anymore. I cannot, I cannot do the mental gymnastics to make this okay. So I, I basically bailed a semester out of graduating with my, uh, with my degree in engineering and changed that all over to a degree in, in art because I had, I had the credits. So it was, you know, I could stuff them around in different ways to make it work. And I, um, was, uh, in the, I graduated in studio arts with a kind of minor in, um, computer science and human computer interaction. And, uh, from there, uh, graduated right into the 2008, uh, crash. <laughs> So all those uh, all those jobs in animation and like those kind of early VR startups and all of that stuff just just vanished. Um, it was sort of it's kind of the, <laughs> the theme of my career, um, the best worst timing. Um, so from from there, I uh, was like, well, what do I do now? And I figured I'll go back to school. Um, and I was started looking at kind of a grad school programs, trying, you know, still applying for jobs, waiting for the economy to sort of come back. And I know this industry was also having a, having a fun time with that. Um, but I saw a concert specifically, it was the Lights in the Sky, uh, Nine Inch Nails, I think, I'm trying to remember who all was designing on that. It's, it's escaping me right now. Um, but it was sort of, it was very interactive. Like the, you know, there was so much, um, interaction between the band and the screens, lights, like they used light to, you know, to, to wipe out pixels on the screen. They had like break beam sensors and, and things like that. So it was, it was very much uh, this, it was everything I knew how to do. It was everything I loved doing. It was concerts, it was light, it was video, it was programming, it was human computer interaction. And I was like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> so from, from that moment on in 2008, I kind of, tailored my whole career trajectory to figure out how do I, how do I do that kind of concert? How do I, how do I make that kind of experience for people? Um, and that's how I got here. Went to CalArts, uh, you know, found Bob Boniel's name in it. He was teaching at CalArts, applied. Wasn't sure I could get into a theater program because uh, none of my experience up to that point led to that, but I was pretty sure I could get into an animation program. Uh, so I applied for experimental animation at CalArts and it's been kind of history since then. 
That's really interesting, especially when you consider the options that you probably had and uh, to be fortunate enough to uh, actually find Bob and to have him direct you because yeah. he does a lot of this. Yeah. Fun, funny story. He left CalArts the year I came, so I ended up being taught by his student, oh, okay. Pablo, a little bit. <laughs> and so we met later on. But yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, like I said, best bouncing That's around. That's really interesting. I mean, it's, um, it's so serendipitous when you yeah. think about it. You know, Mm -hmm. and you kind of found your own niche when you think about it, too. Yeah, because when I started to uh, do some research on you, and and of course, I've been following your career back when you were doing a lot of stuff with the Foo Fighters, when you first started doing with the Foo Fighters, because I saw some of those concerts. I was so impressed with them. I was like, wow, I mean, look, look at all the stuff this amazing woman does. She's really like much more holistic than you would imagine and having people like we talked about earlier pigeonholed into certain specialties. So, uh, yeah, I think that's really, really cool. Hey, Kirsten, this is such a a pleasure Um, and your career is so interesting. We have heard that you have a very interesting technical side to your process. Could you sort of elaborate what that means? Uh, There are lots of technical and and artistic sides to the process. I think our... Our approach that the sort of our studio is known for is um, is very much an under like for as technical as we are both both my partner and I have uh, backgrounds in computer you know computer programming and engineering so um, part of that is how we use that is, is sort of making tools for ourselves especially in the early days um, we did a lot with processing and did a lot with like um, code-based, time-based media, so using processing to generate, um, you know, uh, to generate effects and generate um, some kind of live input, uh, either sound reactive or human reactive um, type systems for ourselves. But in in discovering sort of how, what the limitations of that are, um, what we really found was interesting was the component of liveness, the component of something that is real in the world that creates the reaction in in the video or or lighting um whether that's and that can take pretty much any form but we found ourselves working under camera a lot um like using sound and liquid to generate effects or using like some really old techniques like hand drawn animation just and you know stop motion you know things from the earliest days of animation into these really technical processes so that you can you can make this kind of blend make you know it's it's animation like the hand drawn animation is so time consuming right i've i've you know for paul mccartney for example we did for being for the benefit of mr kite that was all hand drawn loops you know done within a week and my hand still kind of cramps thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> so i was just there over a you know over a light box with a pencil like doing tracing these loop backs and and all of these different things but there's there's a look to that you know that that hand that that life that kind of life breathing process mm-hmm. of animation that um, I've found I, I can't really get any other way. I can't, there's, there's nothing that really generates it programmatically. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a, there's something about the, the real under camera, like either the, the filmed process, but those are so time consuming um, that it makes it impractical and too expensive for a lot of, you know, a lot of the timelines and budgets that, you know, our productions sort of fall under. So, our kind of our almost our claim to fame is like using using kind of a hybrid of these really technical processes to loop them, bring them in, change them so that you can do sort of the minimal amount of this this high intensity work and use it a lot of different ways so that it becomes practical for um, for a concert timeline and budget. That's that's great. I feel like you and uh, a gentleman I went to grad school with, Dan Scully, his stories from his Harvard days to computer science to what he's doing now. I just adore. I know Dan. Dan and I have worked together. <laughs> yeah. So, Kirsten, could you please discuss how you approach video and lighting collaboration and integration? The projects I like best are the ones where the video and the lighting are considered completely together as like from the same amount of time and and even the set like when the set design like the actual screens design the set the video the lighting is considered as kind of an entire creative thought together so the designers i think i've enjoyed working best with the projects i think have been most successful are the ones that have been the tightest integration from the beginning because there you know it can be seen kind of as two ways i think a lot of projection and video you know 
when that started becoming uh, more prevalent in theater and in concerts, there's sort of a fight. You know, there's always a fight for space, for for lumens, for um, you know, for what makes sense. Like an LED wall is always, you know, at full full strength is always going to blow the heck out of uh, you know your beams. <laughs> um, you know, your your lighting and and is always going to blow the heck out of a projector. Like you know, there there is there is always a discussion that has to take place. Like because if everybody just goes full on, like this is what I want to do, when they all meet in the middle, you know, on stage somebody's going to end up unhappy, <laughs> um, which, mm-hmm. you know, it's chaos. It's, it's chaos. Total chaos. It, it's, I mean, and then you get the sound department and they're hanging their line arrays and you're like, well, <laughs> why were those on the drawing? The projectors go right through those. That's not going to work. So like, <laughs> did that ever happen to you? Uh, did that ever happen to oh you? Where, like they blocked yes. like your projector? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like, oh my when, God. when the finally drawings get merged, like, yeah, like, oh, this has to move. This is interesting. Like, of, of course, like from, from a very practical, like physical standpoint, you you know, right. all of these things are competing for space. And from a creative standpoint, all of these things are competing for space. What really needs to take up the most space is what exactly, what story you're trying to tell. What, you know, if it's a band, like what, what is the environment that the band is performing in? Like, it's, it's very easy to lose sight of what actually serves the creative purpose of what you're doing. And so, yeah, the things that have been the most successful, like really bring that all together at the beginning. And everything is sort of in service of that that core story, you know, whether it's a whether it's a story, whether it's a look, whether it's an environment, um, you know, whether it's a it's a band and their um, you know and their relationship with their fans and their relationship with like say what pictures their fans are taking. Like, there's usually a really core theme that everything else comes out of. And I'm talking, you know, like we're talking to the lighting designer and the set designer. From the beginning, the whole thing is designed together. And, you know, that that can be pretty rare, especially in things like, you know, large festivals where, you know, these things are siloed out and until they come together because, of, you know, that's that's sort of the nature of the beast. But like you said, the Foo Fighters, uh, the 1975 or video and light are, are one element that have to play, you know, in in this space as the same thought. And it's not always practical because that sometimes takes a lot of time. Like you can, the previous tools are maybe getting there to, to get us to the point where we can kind of map some of that out or, it'll, you know, you have a long relationship with that designer, you know, you can kind of discuss, you know, what the intent is and, and kind of start tailoring that early. But in a lot of ways, having that time on site to like look at the whole rig together as a, as a whole thought, which is hard to get is what's going to get you the best results. It really is like a, a canvas and paint, and they all have to exist in the same place. I guess I have the next question, which is that we think the name of your company is um, really cool. Electronic countermeasures. How did you come up with that? I love it. <laughs> that that's, that comes from a, a couple fold. My, you know, both of our kind of my background in uh, I worked on. You know, worked at Lockheed Martin briefly, worked on some planes, <laughs> worked on some things. Uh, so there is there is sort of a tongue in cheek, like, you know, military. Uh, oh, so there's a defense right? mechanism. Def- but it, yeah, so electronic countermeasures is, you know, it's the it's it's missile defense, right? Like it's uh, it's some kind of like jamming frequency or something that's, that uh, keeps you alive when people are shooting at you, which was we got our we got our name because that's what we were doing early on in our career like we were we were brought in a lot as fixers like something would go horribly wrong and the budget would be gone and you know and we were we were young and unknown so it was like well these two have a history of uh, you know standing up broken projects uh, come in and like what can they do with it so we we ended up on a lot of like rescue missions uh, you know, that could be a good thing or a bad thing because <laughs> when I was young, I was known how to make really ugly sets look good. Yeah. The problem was is that I was only hired <laughs> when they had ugly sets. <laughs> right. That's so, you know, you start out being the, the fixer call. Like, you're like, well, we've exhausted every other option. Let's try these new kids, you know. And that's not all of our, that was not all of our jobs, but it was enough of them early on that it was sort of a, sort of an inside joke, like, you know, time to defend them from the slings and arrows of outrageous, terrible tech decisions. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's great because that's what we do. We solve problems. We solve problems. Designers. Yeah. And it's all, it's all that. So like after we, you know, you save, you save enough 
things and you get a good reputation, then people, then you become the first call. And then it's like, well, what can we do when we have the whole budget and the whole time? And you know, exactly. how we can have we... the designers for that, you know, yeah. we, we just need you to fix the problems <laughs> that they screw the up. Well, you'll, you'll be yeah. hearing for us in six weeks. Yeah, it still sometimes happens. <laughs> 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 like, we don't want to do it that way or that's too much money. And, <laughs> and then he's like, well, if we don't hear from you again, that's fine. And then when you call us in six weeks, we'll, we'll smile and be like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's stuck, you know, it, it's just kind of stuck as, as from that joke, but it is sort of a cool name. It doesn't fit on any paperwork <laughs> or anything <laughs> like that. So you're like, it's many syllables. But yeah, for from there, it's just sort of become our our brand and people, people know us. And even if we thought it was funny to start with, we are definitely stuck with it now. <laughs> so tell us about your fabulous work on the MTV Video Music Awards. How did you collaborate and integrate with the other video designers on the show? So that's that's kind of an example, like, you know, of a project where a lot of the parameters are put in place for you before you even mm -hmm. you kind of even get there. Like the stage is already built. The lighting rig is already there. Like um, you you kind of are are then having to work with your band and your designer into what already exists. And I had kind of a, a unique position on that show because I was coming in as the Foo Fighters video designer, working with Dan Hadley, working with, you know, their management, what they wanted. Um, but also uh, I was brought in to be kind of the content manager, which is the other half of my career is doing this like very you know, technical, um, you know, very detail oriented, like getting it all together and putting it all in one place. Make sure it all shows up on the screen from different. So I, I'm, you know, very embedded within the team that's doing the actual like pushing of the button, pushing the go button when, you know, when it's going out for the VMAs, which is a very different relationship to the stage than like you have when you're just out with the tour. So to kind of answer that question, you know, we, I know, I know what that system is capable of. I know what the limitations are and what they're up against is that that team, you know, that's coming, that's doing the whole VMAs video thing is, you know, how many acts were there? 15? You know, mm -hmm. there's so there's, they've got a very set amount of time that they can spend um, on each band. And if you kind of, if you can't get it to work out within that set of time, it's pretty much not going to happen. Like they'll do anything. They're a great team. They'll do anything to help you if they can. But, you know, you have to respect the fact that you are one band, even if it might be, you know, it's the most important thing to you. You're one of many important things to them. Um, so in that respect, it's trying to make a design and make a, you know, make something, everybody wants something to stand out and be different. You know, of course, that's what we, that's what we're there for is to like, you're, you're one of 15 bands. Everyone wants a very different thing, but also making sure that it's going to work within that system and can be, um, you know, can be achieved in the time you have. For the Foo Fighters, for their tour, um, what we wanted to do was make it very much about being there make it about um, make the video less something that's brought in and tells the story from, from the screen to the audience. We wanted very much that story to be sort of an elevation and a, a conversation between like the audience that was there and the band as they're on stage right now. Um, so for that show, we had like you know, 15 cameras on stage, you know, looking at different, you know, we can zoom in on the pedal boards and we can zoom in on, you know, you can go under the under the drums. You have all these different cameras on things. So each of the the textures for the tour are very much made up of a, a notch block and a little bit of pre-rendered video, um, you know, some textures and other things. But largely, it's all created out of things that are already present in the room. The camera facing back at the audience, you know, the traditional IMAG shots that you're going to have to you know make sure that everybody can see Dave's face, and you know. And the kind of relationship that you brought in, but also these details that are, if you're close, if you're lucky enough to be in the front row, you might, you might see, but you know, you're never going to get an overhead shot necessarily of somebody's pedal board and what they're pushing. And we can kind of bring that in. For the VMAs, obviously it's, it's a much shorter set. <laughs> we have three songs um, and not even the full songs of those. So we have to tell that story very quickly, but we also have kind of an interesting, like we have a floor, you know, we have a video floor and you know, the, we have the, the lighting and we still wanted to keep that sort of live input. So we did, did get them to add, um, you know, add kind of another D3 system that had a notch, you know, it's enough capability to do our sort of notch block. 
and we brought in the uh, the spider, you know, the spider cam that's being used. You know, we choreographed that with so that at certain points, like during and learn to fly, you know, in the chorus, we had the spider cam looking right out over the the stage and the floor, and then pulling back and spinning, kind of to do a little bit of a video feedback look into the floor. And it's a it's a great shot. It took a lot of work, you know, a lot of coordination between different departments to kind of like make that one moment happen. I think it really, really worked. Bringing in the Foo Fighters as, you know, they're, they're super charismatic, you know, they're super in tune with the audience. They're, there's this, this moment, so kind of to feed that out into the, into the cameras, into the TV that, you know, the people watching home are seeing, like, that's a, that's a hard ask. And I think, I think that a few, in a few moments, we really managed to, to get that there. Yeah. It was incredibly well uh, produced and uh, well designed. We talked about this on the show a few weeks ago. We actually talked about the, the VMAs and, uh, and, and your work and, and also the work of the other fabulous designers on it. The floor was amazing and it really worked well. There were only a couple of spots I thought it was kind of weird. So some of the high shots, but what the shot you're talking about was brilliant. But anyway, you mentioned the Foo Fighters. Tell us how you got involved with the Foo Fighters. Um, that was, uh, Dan Hadley came to us. Um, I threw, uh, we'd worked with Beck, um, Everything we've done has been has been basically word of mouth through designers. I think like people have had a good experience, or we've able, been able to sort of integrate well into you know specific workflows. I think there are some bands we work definitely better for, and for for bands like Beck and the Foo Fighters who don't do a lot of there's not a lot of time color. A lot of it's very live. A lot of it's very present in the rooms. That aesthetic of being responsive to the the live environment um, really fits fits well. So we worked with. Uh, with Beck and their team, and uh, it was kind of a funny story. So we, you know, we we sent out a lot of stuff to them, and they were very busy. Like it was a very last minute turnaround. We didn't hear back. Like when we sent sort of the, like we're like, do you, is everything okay? Do you need anything else? And we, nothing came back. It was like, okay, well, I hope uh, I hope that was I hope I hope they got what they needed. You know, that sounds like one of my nightmares. <laughs> no, it really is. You're like, uh, you know, and then the you know the invoice goes out, the check comes back. You're like, well, I guess I guess they they liked it. Um, but then we, you know, got a call from Dan Hadley. He's like, "Hey, my friends over at uh, Beck said you gotta, we gotta talk to these people. They did a real good job with us, and we, we think it'd be a good fit." And then, you know, just a couple of meetings with him, you know, talk through what he was looking for, what, uh, you know, what his aesthetic. You know, he knows that band very well. He's been with them a long time, so it's very easy to communicate. Like, for him to communicate to us, this is what works for me. This is what doesn't, and for us to then respond to that. Yeah, working with the Foo Fighters, it's just, it's you know, it's a band that. You know, I, I don't want to say I'm <laughs> what exactly age I've been listening to for a long time. Like my middle school self would be ah, so, so you're proud a fan. of you're, myself. You're a fan. Yeah. yeah. You're like saying, yeah. uh, and, one and day I'll be too. working for these people. Nah, no, that's I like didn't. meeting, you know, <laughs> nah, it's never going to happen. And then all of a sudden, wow, I can just imagine. Yeah, wow. it's, it's a vocabulary, you know, you get to, especially with bands, you know the music and, you know, even newer bands, you know, we spend a lot of time listening to the music. So we want to do things that we like because to, to do a band and you know, to work with a band that this music you don't understand or don't really mesh with, you're not going to do, I think, as good of a, a job as something that like you really understand what that aesthetic is and what they're what they're trying to communicate. When I was a younger man, I used to have a Mark Brickman voodoo doll. <laughs> because I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. So I used to like say, there you go, Mark, take this. <laughs> That's funny. I can just imagine. <laughs> well, I know that Kirsten said she had a terrible stage fright, but this says that you list yourself as a performer. Have you done performance? I have. Uh, I, I have been, I've been a musician. Um, I've, I've sung with the New York Oratorio Society. You know, I've sung at Carnegie Hall and the Rudafinum. So I've done some. I'm not. It's it's mostly acting with, and speaking with the stage, right? Like I can. So I I know what it's like to be out on stage too, and like what environment will will kind of, I would be most comfortable in. I was a not very good dancer. Uh, <laughs> I've mean, I mean, I've played I've played flute in an experimental metal band. I'm make your obligatory Drethro Tull joke now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you do Aqualung? Did you do any sort of like Aqualung or were you in more to like, like the early Jethro Tull stuff, the stuff that was really jazzy? It was fantastic. Are you a jazzer? Are you an improv uh, musician? 
Not so much. No, I, I do like the notes to pretty much say what they're, they're well, going Only there. because I, the reason I ask is because a lot of what you're talking about with your work with the Foo Fighters seems like it's somewhat improvisational mm -hmm. uh, of light of the moment. And I was just wondering if that moved over into your music as well. No, I think for, for music, I think I, I do enjoy jazz. You know, grew up listening to it. My dad's a huge fan. Yeah, as far as performance goes, I have done, you know, video as instrument. I played in some bands in grad school, you know, and, and worked with some some kind of ensembles and theater groups and sort of other things to sort of figure out what the role of video as an instrument or as a character or how is video more than a backdrop? How is it more than, um, you know, a, kind of a a single note in a larger composition how is it how is it more integrated into what that is so I, I did a lot of experimentation with like what does a video instrument look like you know I've made a few interfaces or you know in some even in that experimental metal orchestra where I played the flute I also had some like some you know did some synthesizer work with them or like we did some some video backdrop stuff that uh you know tried to figure out like where where is that tipping point between uh, something that is reactive and something that is performative that makes it feel vital. I do find in some places that works out in a professional context, you know, and in some cases it's, it's less appropriate. Some things will start out, you know, sound reactive or performative reactive and then, you know, simplify down into uh, something that's more rendered out or, or more repeatable, depending on what the needs of the performance and of the tour are. I'm less prescriptive about what the technology is and more about what enables the effect we want to have. Although it does sound like you've got a pretty complete toolkit because you just talk about, you know, disguise and notch and unreal and touch designer and it's all just there. It's all just there. Yeah. I'm not going to say I'm equally good at programming any of it, but I, I do want to, to know enough. You know, I do have enough of a base knowledge about what all of it does to come up with what the appropriate solution is, bring the right people in. If, you know, I'm not much of a touch designer person. Like I, I do, if I need that to happen, I know who to call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, there's so many tools and all of them have, you know, it's, it's really about what you're trying to do and getting in the right tools and the right people and the right team and have it coming all around back to that collaboration is like, you know, are you a video designer or a touch designer programmer? Are you an animator or a lighting designer? Back to that kind of post-disciplinary idea, it's really about having that, that team and those people and, and enough of the knowledge, especially at where I guess I am in my career, to know who to call and know when it's the best time for me to jump in and actually get my hands into the thing or what it, you know, do I call Rod McLaughlin? Do I call Dan Scully? Do I call, you know, the people at Possible to come, you know, do some amazing Unreal work or what, you know, whatever. Um, I just, I just enjoy the overall design and process and, and storytelling. So I don't know what that makes me, but. It feels like you play designer and then you have to go into like project management mode. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. You're like, okay, now I have this idea, but I need 90 Nine people, people to, to do, do it. their individual things. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes I have to get out the light box and the paper and pencils and hand draw some stuff. I do love that everything you know, I don't know what every day is going to hold necessarily. I don't know what every project is going to need. Like I, I might be flying between different skill sets. You know, I know, I know enough lighting. You know, I know I can program if I have some time, I can program some stuff on an MA too. My first uh, like, interview, I guess, with uh, like Tobias Rylander when, you know, we eventually did like the 75 together. He's like, oh, I, I need a programmer. I'm like, okay, that's me. And he's like, so, you know, MA too. And I'm like, oh, not, you know, I'm going to make motions with my hands here, which is bad for a podcast. But, you know, this kind of programming, typing, typing on a keyboard, not this type of programming, like touching an MA, mm -hmm. <laughs> like different kind of programmer. But, you know, I've had, I've had some time or some, some projects where I can't necessarily afford to bring in a programmer. So I had to then learn to, to you know, program some of these lighting consoles myself because it wasn't cute that I didn't know how, but... So I know enough to like get myself in trouble with that, but I'm definitely not going to sit down next to a designer and say, hey, I'm your lighting programmer. Like, guess what? We're going to be here all week with me trying to do a waterfall chase. <laughs> so, where's that button? Where's the button? <laughs> like, please, please, chase. please escape. <laughs> escape. Pig. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Zach told us that you have some great stories about your experience inside the NBA bubble. 
Would you share a few with us and explain to me what an NDA <laughs> bubble is? <laughs> oh, the bubble. Well, well, first of all, Zach told us that you had a giant umbilical cord going from the arena into your hotel room or something like that. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, what was that all about? <laughs> the magic of Disney, as it turns out, <laughs> is really the fact that the whole resort is connected by just kilometers of fiber. Uh, the whole thing is wired up with, with dark fiber um, that they can light up. And apparently from resort to resort, from venue to venue, there's just all sorts of interconnectivity. Had us finding that out was, you know, because of COVID protocols, the NBA bubble, just to, just to go back. The NBA wanted to have a season during the like height of uncertainty around COVID, right? Like we didn't have a vaccine yet. We didn't have a lot of things going for us. So how do you play? How do you make a season happen safely? And this is this is really uncharted territory. So their protocol was to like, well, let's just bubble everybody. We'll test every day. We'll, you know, no contact with the outside world or as little contact as possible. We'll keep you sequestered and safe and all this other stuff. And I will keep personnel down to a, a bare minimum, as, as little congregating as possible. This is already sounding like a really uh, a great way to run three months yes. of your life. I can, <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's just tell you right now, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> because no, we're all sitting right. in our homes we're during those three months. Thing. It was just Tiger um, King. That's right, Tiger King. That's what right. we had. I did not watch Tiger King, uh, probably because I was in the bubble. Um, Consider yourself lucky. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> so in order to do this really safely, we needed to then, like, to kind of kick that off, everybody needed to quarantine. Like, we needed to have seven days. It started out as 14 days. Thank God it wasn't 14 um seven days where we were all like super isolated like get your get your pre-quarantine test test every day and we'll just sort of make sure that there's no like covid floating around in the population as much as possible but the quarantine period uh also coincided with kind of our major delivery time for all of this video content and there is there's 22 teams uh, each team has its own content company. Uh, the NBA itself has its own kind of content division house. There is a lot of, and there's, you know, every court is ringed with three sides of, you know, LED walls, it's like a quarter mile of LED. So you can imagine there's just a, a, just a flood of content coming in. And you're sort of telling us that like, we need to uh, quarantine and not leave our hotel rooms at the exact same time that you need to take delivery of all of this and look at it and have meetings about it and kind of, so how do we get that done? Uh, and the solution was to put the entire video team uh, in a line of rooms uh, at the Coronado Springs Hotel, as close as they could get us to the, the Terminator, the, the closet of that dark fiber. So they can link us up to the actual venue where all of our stuff is, all of the screens are, all of that via that fiber. And it's very close to us being there, like get a, get a console in somebody's room. So there's a line of, imagine a line of just, you know, video people as programmers, one console in somebody's room. I've got my content management station, you know, kind of roll gaff tape and other things between the rooms. I'm not sure if that's allowed or not, but, um, <laughs> you know, so during this quarantine period, uh, we were basically operating as a, a tethered um, front of house to the venue. And then after the quarantine period, uh, you know, everybody else who could, you know, had to bring the, brought their consoles back and were like in, but for the content manager, me, there was really no difference between me running the, the various NAS, you know, storage situations and, and all of that from the venue or from my room. And since the whole goal is to keep people in the venue as low as possible, uh, there was no reason to move me back into the venue. So for the next two and a half months after quarantine, I, uh, I stayed in my room with my <laughs> computer. Quarantine, basically. Uh, it, was, it was a great, you know, it was good to not in some ways have to go to the venue because, again, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what was safe. You know, if you think back then, we didn't, well, there was a certain amount of risk. So, you know, of course, if I could stay out of it, uh, even better. But at the same time, it's like, has anyone seen Kirsten in a few days? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and my team did make sure like somebody made sure I'd left and eaten lunch, you know, <laughs> and seen, you know, gone on a walk or, or something. And it was like, again, it was it was just a flood of content that uh, I was managing, especially when we had all of the teams. So there were some pretty long days 
the show was so big, it didn't all fit on a single, like we couldn't fit the whole show on a server. So it was a lot of pulling off, pulling files off of servers and making sure only the, you know, the teams that needed to be in each thing had their content, but like teams that weren't playing that day or for the next couple of days, those would kind of go into a cold storage situation and we'd pull that back on. So it was a lot of just managing files. I don't know what it, like, what do you, what do you get when you have a D3 that uh, is suddenly missing three quarters of its media that it knows about? Like you have a very angry <laughs> D3. So how was the food? Was the food good at least? No, Did they give you no, like no, really no, good no, food? No, no. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever heard of a cheeseburger egg roll? Uh, no, oh. and I don't want to know anything more about it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sounds awful. <laughs> were, were there conjugal visits allowed? I mean, do I mean you were totally like no. completely removed? <laughs> well, I mean, according maybe some people had some. I don't know, but no, we <laughs> okay. we weren't uh, we weren't allowed to. You know, you we weren't allowed to go and see friends. You know, we or in, in Orlando too. Florida was really hard hit. You know, at that point, like that was a bad place to be. Um, right then, and so yeah, we we. We weren't, you know, you couldn't even, you couldn't even call uh, a Postmates, you know, they didn't, they didn't even want you postmates in food. <laughs> so you were pretty stuck with whatever they were willing to deliver to you. Um, yeah, cheese, what, what were they, egg cheese, rolls? What, cheese, cheeseburger egg roll. <laughs> cheeseburger egg rolls. Uh, my other favorite was a uh, shrimp in an Asian box. That was, that was, that was some questionable food. <laughs> Is that maybe. what it was called? <laughs> it shrimp was. in an Asian box? We have no, pictures that's of it. That's not a good. That's going to be. By the way, that's going to be the title of this episode: Shrimp, Shrimp in, a, in an Asian box. It, there was yeah. There were some definite questionable food choices. Uh, my favorite mm. was cup of ice. Cup of cup ice. Of ice. <laughs> <laughs> How much does that cost? Uh, I, I don't know. I have to ask the NBA. Yeah, Probably a lot. Right. Yeah, I, it sounds like the NBA spared no expense when it came to the uh, Epicurean delights they offered. And you know, for a lot of the cases, the players were not in any better situation. I were some, there were some pictures from the, the players' like Instagram accounts. They're like, really? And I'm like, well, I feel a little bit better knowing that you're eating it, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Shrimp like, in an Asian box. I, I'll, give them, I'll give them some credit. Like, they it's a it's a logistical nightmare. It really is. How do you? Yeah, I can imagine. How do you yeah. they do this under COVID protocols? And nobody, you know, nobody really wants to. You think like living at a Disney resort would be great, but really a week is probably as <laughs> much as you want. COVID. Three months, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's crazy. I was at a Marriott like two weekends ago for my niece's wedding and it's in Brooklyn, right? That's a really nice Marriott, but they had nothing. There was no restaurant open. There were no bars weren't open. They even fired the concierge. There was no concierge. It was crazy. I mean, yeah. it's nuts how, what's happening. It's it's a diff yeah, difficult time. But, you know, Mickey Mouse Pancake Day was definitely a good day. <laughs> well, those good pancakes? Mickey Mouse pancakes? I mean, well, yeah, anything that was Mickey Mouse shaped, like Mickey Mouse Churro Day, Mickey Mouse Waffle Day. It was good. Nice. Big Potato Day was usually a favorite. <laughs> when you have those, Chip and Dale come over and they want to know which one is which, but they don't talk. So you have to guess which one is Chip and which one is Dale. And there's a dead giveaway, but you have to know it, so... Oh, is one Jewish and the other one's not? No, one has a chocolate chip nose <laughs> and the other oh, one doesn't. Oh, okay, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think Kirsten and Okay, Kirsten now I know. That <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. But they don't let you look there. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I used to work at Disney. I would look there all the time because I was curious. So I was a uh, cartoon character curious. Oh, that's so, hilarious. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so... Do you have any advice for our student listeners who might wish to enter the fields of pixels, programming, or immersive design? Um, you know, yeah, I think my best advice is to find sort of the, figure out what your angle is. What is your, what are the things that excite you and that what can you contribute uniquely to that world? You know, of course, be looking at what everybody's doing, be, be cognizant and aware of what they're, but emulating somebody's style or thinking you have to be very much like, I want to be exactly like this person or I want to do what this person is doing. You know, I hear, I have taught, I hear from a lot of students, like I, I wanted my career, I want to be like this. It's, it's more about, for me, being open to what, how you interact with the people around you and yourself and what, what excites and drives you. What, what, what is the experience you are trying to create that only you uniquely can create and finding what that is. That's, that's, you know, it sounds in a sentence, that's actually 
that's a really hard thing to do. And it's a question you kind of have to keep asking yourself and will probably continue asking yourself throughout the rest of your career. Like, what is it I'm trying? What, what exactly do I do here? What am I trying to give to this that only I can give to this? And being pretty, my, my other then piece of advice is uh, be, be good to yourself mentally and physically. This is a hard space to work in. Um, we're finding kind of out now with the, we're, you know, in the language of the, the IATSE strike and all that. We're in this moment that, um, you know, it is, it is a difficult, it's, it's a difficult environment to work in. It's, uh, it demands a lot of you. Um, find ways to recharge what it is that makes you want to be here and, and come into the space and find ways to respect that of yourself and of that of the people you work with and that we're all sort of human and we have human bodies and those things have needs. And, you know, I think we can all from, from the student to the people hiring students to, you know, find, finding out what it is to be really respectful of, of what we are all trying to do here. And you will have a good, a much better experience. Yeah, I think that's really important advice. We've talked a couple times about the sort of life work balance. And as you said, it's certainly mm-hmm. coming to the forefront with the IATSE situation. So discussion yeah, for another day. Yeah, work life balance is a hard discussion for another day. But yeah, be, yep. be honest with yourself. Be honest with your the people around you and do what you love. And remember that you're doing it because you love it. And if you could love doing something else more, you know, do it, do it, because this is very difficult, <laughs> but you're here, you know, yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's, that's great advice. It really is. It's about love and it's about passion and it's about making the world a better place. But don't let that passion be exploited. It's not, it's also about, you have to love it and you have to want to be here, but you also have to be, you have to take care of, be taken care of and, and make sure that you can take care of what you need to take care of. It has to, it has to balance. Very wise, very wise words. Well, Kirsten, thank you so much for being here with us today. You know, ever since I saw that old Food Fighters uh, uh, video, I was like saying, wow, I got to, this is amazing work. And then I saw the work on the uh, Video Music Awards. Wow. I, so that, now I really need thank to you. find out. Yeah. I mean, we actually talk about, you should check out the show. I mean, we, we yeah, actually talk about it quite a bit. We do a whole, let's talk about it about any, anyway, but uh, I've got a little bit of advice for, for you and that is stay off those damn cheeseburger egg rolls because they, they oh, God, if, I never, if I never saw another one of those again it would be too soon and no shrimp in boxes I don't, no. I don't even want to hear that anymore even though that's what we're going to probably call the it cup of ice cup of ice and for dessert we have a cup, a of, cup ice. of ice I guess it depends what you put in the ice That's yeah right. if there's vodka <laughs> in that ice I'm all for it thank you alright guys let's wrap it up the rocking sounds of the luminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to light talk you can hear our show on spotify itunes google youtube live design online.com amazon prime music and just about every other podcast site out there check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on facebook and subscribe to our podcast that way you will not miss a second of light talk insanity no guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast however If you do decide to litigate a law firm of a flecked flock, flaring glare in their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista, coming to you today from Long Beach, Los Angeles, Dallas, and the great city of Philadelphia. And be sure to join us next week when we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So our thanks again to post-disciplinary artist Kirsten Hovland, and we will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Light Talk.